Cancer. It's a disease of uncontrollable cells growing throughout the body and is arguably one of our greatest modern medical challenges. But put your hand up. Have you ever wondered how cancer occurs, why it occurs, or why some cancers are curable and others are not? <laughs> well, you notice that I've got my hand up too, and I've been researching the disease for over 10 years. And in fact, every cancer researcher I know would also have their hands up. And that's because cancer is incredibly complex. To put it into context, if you looked at the total number of scientific studies with the word cancer in their abstract, you would find that there are over 4 million papers. And we're adding another 4,500 studies to that total each and every week. So not surprisingly, trying to keep on top of all that literature is incredibly challenging. Now let's think about how most of us interact with that type of information. We're probably thinking social media, blog posts, YouTube, content designed for rapid digestion with short half-lives. Trying to summarize an entire body of literature and the nuance behind that is incredibly tough. And let's just take a quick example. Let's look at one single statistic or a single graph. So this is showing you the total number of cancer deaths per year worldwide from 1990 to 2017. And you can see the total numbers are constantly on the rise with an alarming almost 10 million deaths worldwide. Now, if you looked at this statistic by itself, you, know, you might think that we as cancer researchers are doing a pretty poor job at preventing and curing cancer. So if you looked at this from a different angle, you'll actually find that we're doing pretty well. If you looked at the actual rate of how we're surviving over a five-year time point, comparing 1970 to 2014, you'll see that we're not actually not doing too bad, that we're beginning to push that needle closer to the right, closer to that 100% mark. Now, there's obviously a long way to go. We're not there yet. We still haven't got a cure for all cancers. But it does show that we're making progress and our investments in medical research are paying off. Now, let's take another example. Who here has seen something being associated with cancer in the media, and then the next week, the complete opposite happening? A good example of this is coffee. <laughs> so put your hand up if you ever heard that coffee increases your risk of cancer. Yeah. Put your hand up if you've heard that coffee decreases your risk of cancer. So we're getting a mix of both. And you'd both be right. Literally within the last six months, we've seen scientific studies that have been spread widely in the media showing both of these. Now, again, you might be looking at me as a cancer researcher and think, man, you guys have no idea what you're doing. <laughs> but this is actually part of the scientific process. It's about looking at the entire body of literature understanding the weaknesses and strengths of each individual study and coming to a conclusion. Now, if you're curious, the latest consensus is that coffee probably doesn't either increase or reduce your risk of cancer, except for maybe colorectal cancer. And this is good, because I am definitely getting a coffee as soon as I finish this talk. <laughs> but you can easily see how one could be misled, misinformed, or get an incorrect assumption of what cancer is. Now, why is misinformation and cancer important? But when it comes to cancer, it can mean life or death. There's an abundance of evidence suggests that early detection and early treatment leads to better outcomes for patients. And having a better understanding of what cancer fundamentally is allows one to change their behavior to reduce their risk over a lifetime. And a great example of this is the Slip Slop Slap campaign introduced by the Australian government in the 1980s. Now here, the government wanted to teach people about the harmful effects of ultraviolet radiation from the sun that can damage our DNA and cause skin cancer. So by telling everyone to protect themselves from the sun, protecting their skin, putting sunscreen on, and avoiding the midday sun, it's only now that we're really beginning to see the benefits of that, that the rates of melanoma are actually beginning to go down. This is the first time in 100 years. And this is particularly the case in younger populations, the people that grew up with that message. And this is in stark contrast to the rest of the world where the rates continue to rise. Now, we haven't even discussed about when or how do people seek this cancer information out. And it turns out that most people seek cancer information when they themselves, a friend or a family member, have unfortunately been diagnosed with cancer. 
Now this is not surprising, out of sight, out of mind, but it does raise some challenges. Being confronted with a cancer diagnosis is tough. You don't know what it means for yourself, your health, your family, your finances. And then trying to understand what the disease is happening in your body at the same time with the complexity of what cancer is, is challenging. So I believe, ideally, it would be better to have a good understanding of what cancer is before a cancer diagnosis. Because at least that would help you understand what's happening within your body. And if you've got a better idea of what the scientific process is, it might help you pass out evidence-based to non-evidence-based treatments, or allow you to understand a little bit more precisely the treatments that they're trying to assign you. So the question isn't if an informed and educated community is important. The question is, how best do we do that? Are there unique and innovative ways to teach people about cancer, to get them excited to, to learn about it, or to reach younger demographics, people that don't tend to think about cancer because it doesn't tend to occur to them as much as an older generation. And this has been something that's been on my mind for quite a few years, and it wasn't until recently that I may have found out a solution to that. So every year, all the cancer research teams on our floor come together to celebrate a year's worth of hard work. Now we mix it up, we try to do a bit of team building, have a bit of fun. You know, one year we did some laser tag, another year croquet, but one year we did an escape room. Now if you're not familiar with an escape room, it's an interactive themed experience, usually in a room, and you usually go into there with two to four people, and you have to solve a series of puzzles in a defined set of time. And escape rooms actually got their start in digital video games back in the 90s, before then being taken into the real world in early 2000, before exploding to Eastern Europe in 2010, and now that there are over 5,000 escape room venues worldwide, and it's even made to popular mainstream culture, such as the Big Bang Theory. Now, going back to my story, as you would expect, four PhD qualified scientists with over 50 years of scientific training, of course we finished the room in 15 minutes. <laughs> Wrong. We failed miserably. I, I think in our, our time slot, we only finished about 25% of the room, and that was with the help of AIDS. <laughs> but it wasn't about that. It was about the experience. It was about going into a completely different environment. And so these escape rooms really have a, a strong theme behind them. And it could be something as solving a murder mystery at an end of year Christmas party. It could be trying to escape a dungeon, trying to survive the zombie apocalypse. Because these environments are so rich and so different from the outside world, when you enter it, it almost like resets your brain and allows you to focus on hand exactly what you need to do, which is solving those puzzles. But it's also the, the tactile experience of it, the sounds, the excitement of finishing a puzzle and having to do that with your friends. And so I thought, could we use an escape room as a unique way to teach people about cancer, to get them excited about it, and to potentially reach a younger audience? And so that's what we did. We created Makings of a Malignancy, the world's first cancer biology-themed escape room. Now, it's a three by six meter marquee tent, and we can set it up anywhere around the world. But the benefit of the escape room is it can really transport you into a different space. And I'm commonly hearing from people that cancer is just really hard to visualize. It's something that occurs deep within a cell. And when it becomes a cancer, it's deep within the body. We don't see it. And this is why the benefit of the escape room really shines out. So we decided to make our escape room into three rooms. So we can actually start people in the skin, where they have to solve a series of puzzles to become a cancer, before then spreading into the bloodstream and then eventually the brain. And this shows people how a cancer cell travels throughout the body. And because the pictures are just so vivid and strong, it really allows them to see firsthand how cancer occurs. But we can build on this further and actually design the puzzles to reflect cancer biology. And we took escape room owners and designers, together with cancer researchers, to show a number of different mechanisms that cells have to acquire to become a cancer. And we call these the hallmarks of cancer. And this can be anything from 
gaining a mutation to be able to divide rapidly, the uh, ability to spread to other parts of the body, or evading the immune system. Each one of these different hallmarks can be easily demonstrated in a puzzle. Now, to not give you too many spoilers, I'm just going to give you a couple of insights on how we did this. So the first example is a mutation that you need for a cell to divide rapidly. Now, we decided to use a commonly used uh, tool, which is a UV black light, to reveal hidden messages. Now, here we're showing the UV black light to show a key mutation that allows cells to grow rapidly. Now, the, the benefit here is that we can actually link the UV black light to the ultraviolet rays from the sun, showing that's how mutations occur in your DNA. And then we can add preventative messaging, similar to the Slip Slop Slap campaign, that shows you why it's important to protect your skin from the sun. Another example. Let's look at immune evasion. So the immune system is actually quite active and is always trying to hunt down any cells that are going rogue and becoming cancer. And some cancers can be tricky, and they can actually put this invisible cloak over the top of them to hide them from the immune system. And I sort of like to think of it as Harry Potter's invisible cloak. Now, this puzzle is showing you a tumor and a bunch of different cancer cells that are beginning to, to pop off around it. And you can see the immune cells are trying to, to attack them. Now, there's a secret message hidden here. And to solve it, you actually need to take a clear plastic bit of paper and put it over the top. And this actually causes most of the tumor cells to die. But the few cancer cells that survive are the ones that have that Harry Potter invisible shield. And they're the ones that reveal the messaging. Now, you can see you don't need to have an understanding of what cancer is to finish these puzzles. But you can see how they've been designed to reflect that. And so at the end of our room, we actually have a 10-minute video that explains exactly how all these puzzles were designed to reflect cancer biology. And not only can we introduce preventive messaging, but we can also talk about new treatments, such as immunotherapies, a type of therapy designed to boost your own immune system, to rip off that invisible shield, a drug that's really had a, a revolution in terms of how we treat cancer in modern days, so much so that it got the Nobel Prize for Medicine last year. Now, with over 90% of people who seek out an escape room being aged between 10 and 40, an escape room could be a really unique way to reach a younger audience, to get them engaged about understanding what cancer is. So while an escape room can't cure or prevent cancer, it just might be a really unique way to teach people about cancer, to get them to seek out information and reach a younger demographic that aren't thinking about cancer. So I'll leave you with one final question. Can you solve the puzzle that is cancer? <laughs>